Welcome to the RSP Cast Scout Talk. Russ Landy, Matt Waldman. It's always a joy to um, for us to be here with you. And Russ, you know, we're gonna have a fun topic today because um, kind of an exercise in in kind of decision making and planning, at, you know, from in a theoretical way. Well, yeah, and I think what's I think most interesting is, I mean, you hear everybody for years talk about the NFL is cyclical. Things change. Receivers get bigger, so corners get big and the receivers smaller. And when the game started moving towards passing, I would talk about it's cyclical and got told by so many analytics people, no, 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 no. This is always going to be the way it is because we figured out that passing is the way to win. And while passing may be the way to win, anybody who thinks there's only one way to skin a cat, that that's the mistake. And I think that's what you're seeing now in the NFL. Teams that may not have the whole skill set are saying, how can we skin this cat another way so we can win and not get fired? Yeah, all I know is that some cats carry knives. So you may not be, in, <laughs> you may be in some bad, you know, my cats carried knives. So I think we, they, they will not be skinned. So, but the, uh, <laughs> but I, I hear you. And it's funny because you look this week and one of the things that I noted this week is we're, you know, and really this whole month is that with lighter defensive personnel, a lot of two high shells, there's a legitimate resurrection happening with the ground game in the league. And, and there's some statistical edu- um, indications. According to Michael Lopez, who's an NFL analytics professional, um, who's affiliated with the league, he's noting that they're seeing a drop in EPA, expected points, um, in passing to a level that's only marginal higher than higher than the run right now. Now, they expect there to be a correction to some extent, but, you know, I'll say this. Anecdotally, I've seen an, a significant increase in um, running backs, singular running backs, earning a, num- a high number of touches each week, and not touch- just touches, actual rushing attempts. Like last week, there were 12 running backs who earned at least 19 carries um, in that week. Now, I gave – it's an arbitrary number I picked, Russ, but like I picked 19 because I figured – Somewhere between about 17 and 20 is that point where it's very clear that the team was having success running the ball. Whether you looked at yards per attempt or you looked at anything else, if they were running it that much, the game script was in line for them to be able to do so and they were having success with one guy getting that many touches. So I picked 19. And there were – go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think the most interesting part is you mentioned the two shells. Because if you go back 40 years to even now, one of the first things a quarterback is taught is when you start getting out of your huddle and you, whether you're under set or in the shotgun, you're counting, okay, how many are up in the box? How many are off? And if you start counting and all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I got six in the box and I got six to block them. We're running. Yeah. I got five in the box. So I think it's just sort of ironic that you have that, too deep i think some of the quarterbacks even if they don't want to run the ball more i think it's just they know the rule is so especially it is almost sometimes becoming where you're you have not just as many blockers as defenders you may have one or two more blockers than defenders because they're so spread for the pass that you're like even if i don't want to run it i gotta run it because every rule indicates it so to me that jumped out when you mentioned the, the the two shell That screams out, hey, we're not bringing the one in the box like the old Bengals with David Fulcher, who would come down and be so that fourth gargantuan linebacker and made teams say, all right, we ain't running the ball because Fulcher's going to eat us. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And then we saw what would happen as the dying of the David Fulcher era was when Roy Williams got picked up by the Cowboys to play a David Fulcher-like role, and it was like it was too late. And, And when we look at... You know, like last week when there were 12 running backs last week who ran 19 times um, in a game, the la- I counted in September's like, like I looked. Let's look at last September. Was there a was there a point where there were 12 running backs who had at least 19 touch 19 carries in a in a week? And I I kept counting and going back September from September from September, and it brought, took me back to 2014. With guys like Zach Stacy and Demarco Murray, and you know, um, you know, guys that are long gone in the league right now, or teaching other running backs, and it's like th- this is—it's been a while. It's been almost a decade. So 
And when, with that too high shell, one of the things I'm also noticing is that, you know, obviously with a too high shell, you're seeing also nickel corners. You're also seeing linebackers who are disguised or safeties disguised as linebackers. Um, you know, like the Owusu Koromora kid from Cleveland or the kid from Arizona who are dynamic athletes who can tackle, but they're not big. And yep. when, you know, the biggest thing you'd always hear when people say, well, how come they don't run more power and trap and counter in the NFL like they used to? And it's like, because defensive linemen have gotten, or, and, and defensive um, and linebackers have gotten big enough that they can shed blocks pretty quickly. And if they know where you're going to be, it's strength on strength and the defense is going to win. Well, now every the defense has been spread out. They've got to be lighter, faster, go sideline to sideline. And when you when you're made to go sideline to sideline, and now it's like, no, we're going north south, baby. We're and we're gonna tell you where we're going because we know Kenneth Murray, or you know, I'm picking on somebody, but like yeah. I think of someone who's a lighter linebacker, and maybe he's not a safety size guy, but kind of a lighter guy who gets gets occupied. We're gonna look at guys like that and we're gonna run right at you and we're gonna make you shed and make the tackle because we don't think you're going to be able to do it 18, 19 times a game without us breaking off at least four or five big plays in the running game. Oh, I think, I think there's no doubt it, it, it's led to a fundamental change. And especially when you also add in the defensive linemen, although teams grade them as both run defenders and pass rushers, when rosters get made, when you have to choose between, oh, our, our defensive tackle who's going to start, who's 278, but he's twitchy like Grady Jarrett and can get up the field, or a guy that may be 20 pounds bigger who's better against the run but has no ability to get penetration, teams always are going to side now with the twitchier, more sort of gap-shooting guy. Well, those guys are smaller. Yeah. And also their first thought is rushing the pass. Yeah. So they're attacking, they're getting an arm up, and also, if you get an arm up, that means the run blockers into your, your underarm and you're out of the play. So it totally has changed what you're looking for defensively. I mean, just look at the Chargers. They have the uh, the defense line they brought over from the Rams. I can't remember his full name, but it ends with Day. Yeah. Um, and, and he's a guy that's a penetrating, athletic guy with some good strength. But he's not a, dot, a giant, powerful guy. He's like in that 290 range, which is big for some of these penetrators. But even that is not your ideal power guy. Yeah. Now he, and I will say, he's a good player. He can play the run, but I'm saying that size where you have to start trading size for twitchiness lends itself to the old, the teams are almost playing the old, uh, we're going to stop the run, run on the way to the pass. Yeah. That's sort of what you're seeing now, and that is more effective now. If you have athletic linemen, you can beat that, and you can get runs. And, and this is part of the exercise that we're going to do today, which is we're going to use this time to discuss the impact that this could have on the NFL drafts of the next three to five years if this turns into a sustained trend. And I don't see how it won't. Like, if they're playing too high, maybe last year that you saw more too high shells and the, the young quarterbacks were, like, obstinately and some of the older ones were obstinately just still trying to throw attack downfield because, A, there's probably is some statistical contract motivation here going on in terms of I got to I gotta keep my production up. And if the coach, and probably also from coaches from a systemic standpoint of, like, this is my system and we got, we got these guys and we think we can match up, per, you know, personnel-wise until they run into that wall enough times to go, we need to we need to go back to principled football here. And I also think part of it, and and I, I mentioned this before we got on, is over the past since the Jaguars went to AFC Championship and then seeing the Titans the last three years really become a good team through running the ball, I started asking people in the NFL, executives who were big in analytics, hey, if my team does not have a front line starting quarterback, am I better off to run the ball to control the game? not sort of put my weaknesses out there by running the ball as opposed to throwing it with a quarterback who's not so good when I'm going against the Aaron Rodgers. And they all told me, no, 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 no. You always want to keep passing because passing is shown to give you a better chance of success of moving the ball. And if you don't do it well, you fall behind quicker. So you want to pass the ball. And I always thought to myself, well, I get 
the numbers pointing to that. But when I look at it from a common sense perspective, I think, okay, do I really want to have, whether it's Jacoby Brissett, who I think is a really good backup, but not really what I want as a starter, in a throwing matchup with Aaron Rodgers? Do I really want it to be whoever's better today throwing the ball wins? Or would I rather say, hey, we're going to try to keep Aaron off the field. We're going to control the clock. And when we throw, because we're running the ball well, it's going to be controlled passes that we have a much higher success chance at. So to me, it makes perfect sense that this is where it would go because I think some of the smart people are finally saying, hey, we've got an average or below average starting quarterback. I don't want to get in a shootout with whether it's Aaron Rodgers or whoever it may be. Let's try to win by controlling the game and making throws that have a much higher success ratio and much lower chance of risk. Yeah. So with that in mind, I mean, what would an influx of gap-heavy schemes, because that's the other thing we talked about, is that I'm seeing a ton more teams. Like, it wasn't just like, okay, a couple plays a game, we're going to run power. You know, it feels like I'm I'm seeing power and counter a lot more, and even from spread to the point that I was joking around that old Anthony Dixon from Mississippi State, who used to run from that at Mississippi State, would like thrive now. He's like 12 years too early in the NFL. Um, but would an influx of gap heavy schemes lead to a change in the NFL in terms of what it would value first, say, from offensive linemen? You know. Well, yeah, I think it would. I think, well, firstly, I think what you're seeing, at least to me, is the Eagles may be the prototype that a lot of teams look at. And obviously, the 4 0, so everybody's going to say, of course they are. But if you just look what they've done over the last two or three years, they may have been sort of thinking of this four years ago. And that's sort of who they are. They tend to think a little bit more sort of ahead of everybody else. And that they may have said, hey, if this is the way the game is going, we're not going to be able to run the ball or protect the quarterback with big slower footed linemen we need to sort of reverse the trend and say hey we'll trade 5 10 20 pounds even to get an athlete on the offensive line and i think when you see their line now given their left tackle happens to be a giant who also has rare feet but i think when you also look at their center who's 47 years old but he's always been undersized and lane johnson who was a former quarterback who's never going to be considered a behemoth they have clearly said, hey, both our tackles and our center, these are athletes. Because we want not only guys who can protect the quarterback, but they can get out, lead in space. They can pull, like you're talking about the counters. Who better to pull than athletic guys, as opposed to trying to run a guy who may be fundamentally sound and very strong, but doesn't have that agility to adjust on the move. And nowadays, because of the smaller D linemen, it's not like it used to be where you pull and they're going to be right in front of you. You pull that 278 or 82 pound D tackle, he can take one quick step and he avoids you. So if you're an offensive lineman that can't adjust, stay over his feet, bend his knees and make that block on the move, you're probably not going to be effective making these blocks. So for those teams that choose to go this route, because maybe they don't have an elite quarterback or maybe they just feel philosophically they believe in it, I would expect that they would start looking at, now obviously it's easier said than done, trying to find four or five linemen that are athletic enough to block on the move and in space, but also strong enough to at least be in a tie. They won't yeah. get overpowered. They won't dominate anybody. But all that being said, let's also remember, good linemen are hard to find. So it's easy to say, I want to get four or five. You might be lucky to get one or two or three. The Eagles, I think, just happened to hit some lotteries. They did. And then you could look to the Ravens and say, Tyler Lindenbaum is a good example at center of a fantastic athlete who's a little undersized. Um, but the Ravens know who they are. They know what they want to do, and running the ball has, has been a big part of what they want to do in that offense um, because that vert that horizontal stretch in the run game with Lamar and with their running backs is a big part of allowing them to be able to throw in the middle of the field. So Yeah, well, just look at I mean, I look back to Denver years ago with Mike Shanahan. Right now, the 49ers, I mean, they sort of were the teams that said, we're going to stretch it this way, and we're not going to physically dominate you. We're going to force you to move. And to me, that's even though the athletes are faster on defense because they're undersized, spreading them out, making that, it, it just, to me, it makes so much sense as an offense. You're going to get so many more gaps. 
they, if you have good linemen that can move and stay on their feet and block in space, you could really control games of running the ball today. Yeah, it's like chess. I mean, you want to cover as much of the board as you possibly can and have them account. You have to your opponent count for as much of the board as possible, and then usually there's some sort of error that that, reco- that results or some sort of forced either or situation that's going to be uncomfortable, and you have to strategically know which one's going to be the best best of the of the worst choices. So, what about defensive line? You've talked a little bit about the, the penetrators you know, versus guys who can plug up a gap. And I'm watching, for instance, this wasn't even a gap play, but I'm watching the Broncos player, um, Broncos defensive tackle, um, DJ Jones, just getting dominated on double team after double team after double team to the point that Josh Jacobs is just tearing through that line like play after play because the guy's getting, Jones is getting moved back a yard and a half, two yards and turned before Jacobs even reaches the hole and the only guy who's going to be in the hole to plug it was safety Caden Stearns out of Texas you know as opposed or Jesse Jewell who's more of a passing down linebacker who you know his first thought was to drop on uh, half of these not, maybe not half of these plays but no it but, like every he, time yeah, I saw but his first thought is always get off the ball yeah yeah so what you about know, these I think, guys I think it's a really tough thing because the reality is very few guys are good versus double team yeah. I mean, that, 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 that is the reality. I mean, the Richard Seymour type guys who can control, hold their ground and clog it as opposed to not just get knocked off, but actually stand them up. And those guys are hard to find. And generally, when you find a guy who can control a, a double team, it's a 350 pounder who can't move outside of his box. Right. That's why, again, I, I know I mentioned Philly before. That's why you got to look at Philly again and say, were they thinking ahead of everybody else when they saw Jordan Davis in this year's draft? because is he perfect in all areas? No, he's got his issues. He get a little upright when he starts running. So when he's running, he's not as effective as you'd like him to be because he can't slow down as quickly and the play can undercut him. But if you try to double him, it's over. He's going to be that wall right there, and he's athletic enough to chase and make plays outside of a small area. I mean, that's what you want. But I think it's also unrealistic to expect that you're going to find many 330-pounders who can run. I think what you may find teams start doing is saying, okay, we're going to go back with sort of the old uh, what the Packers did back in the day is they had Gilbert Brown and then they had an under. So they had the nose and an under. Yep. The nose would be the guy that would try to say, I'm going to take two. And the under would always flop to the weak side and he would try to penetrate. Yeah. And if because if, if the under was able to penetrate, the offense would stop doubling. And when they stopped doubling, then that behemoth could make some plays because he could just knock his man backwards. It wouldn't shock me if the trend continues of running, if teams start saying, well, we're not going to go with the 340-pound nose, but maybe we're going to go back to that 310, 315-pound nose who may not get a ton of penetration but can be a controller in the middle and can walk his man at least back to squeeze the pot, even if he's not going to make an impact rush in the passer. Um, I do think, and I know this may sound crazy to people who don't, aren't on the inside or whatever it may be, but a lot of teams base what they're doing based on those other three teams in their division. Yeah. Because those are the teams you have to play. Yeah. So if your whole division is still throwing, 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 you're probably not going to even consider these type things. But if you're in a division where you look at it and say, wow, two of the three teams in the division are going to run it a lot. I mean, if you're in the uh, AFC North or yes, AFC exactly. South, I should say with Jacksonville and uh, Tennessee, I mean, you're instantly thinking, okay, I need to have some bodies in here because if we don't control the run, they're going to run for 200 yards a game. Yeah. So, so you do have to base it on that. I think you're going to see more teams trying to find guys that can control at least not be washed out and eliminated, even if it's just a stalemate at the point of attack versus double teams. Yeah. If it's a stalemate, that's more than fine. Yeah, and I think like – a good example, I was going to say, talk about the North as well, because one of the things that's um, fascinating is, as I'm laughing because I'm seeing something at a, at a website talking about why there's so few elite quarterbacks and I, or elite running backs, and I want to laugh because I think it, they got that wrong. But um, the, there are some elite running backs in this league that I think are pretty good. But the point I'm making is the um, – the, I was going to look up something about the AFC North because 
the AFC North, you, they also have teams that can run you out of the stadium, you know. Oh, and, yeah. And when the Cincinnati Bengals get their line cohesive, I think they'll be one of them as well. But look at, like, the example of the under tackle, who could be a very good one, who may need a buddy to, to, to work off of, is Baltimore's Justin Matabuike. Um, Matabuike is a very toolsy prospect in terms of how he uses his hands. He's very smart. He understands when he has to face double teams, he has some ways to get past it, though he's not big enough to really hold up there. But he also reads the field very well and understands what to do. But he's a penetrator. And mm-hmm. and if they can, he's a perfect under tackle. They just need the other guy, you, yep. you know. And once they get that other guy, I think that that run unit is really going to click, um, especially. And, and it makes yeah. a big difference. People yeah. that haven't seen a team really implement a true because because Gilbert Brown was a true 34 nose tackle in terms of size and power. Yeah. Um, and Dotson was a true like three technique, traditional four, three, just penetrator. And I don't think people realize that those two next to each other can really make things hard for an offense, especially once they get the habit of working together, because Gilbert will just plop himself down and he may slide just to the other side of the center, back and forth, based on the checks by the quarterback. But Dotson would literally jump. He would just literally race around if he saw the offense shifting. And all of a sudden, the whole offensive shift becomes null and void because the nose is still right where he was, except now he's in a better position versus the new call. And Dotson's ready to blow up the new play. That, that model, I think, could be very effective in today's NFL. It would require a Mike who can make the calls instantly. Yeah. So that those two guys know, and even the ends, what changes and what they have to shift to instantly. But I think that going to a true nose with an under could really be a valuable asset in today's NFL. I mean, think about even maybe 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, the Falcons, I remember having a guy who's a veteran that jumpy gathers who could like oh, yeah, basically, jumping, yeah. he could like basically forklift, forklift you. Yeah. He had the forklift and then they had that under tackle from the Raiders who they got from the Raiders who could sack like people because he was such a good penetrator and he would get you like seven or eight sacks from that under tackle position and a lot of t- tackles for loss, you know? Yeah. And, and that, and think about it. If you just find that one guy that alleviates a lot of your concerns of an undersized linebacker of playing two shell, because all of a sudden that one guy can control two blockers, sometimes inching into forcing that third one into an uh, inconvenient or uncomfortable position trying to make his block. And all of a sudden, your run defense takes a huge step. And when you watch Philly this year, when Davis comes in, their run defense is ridiculously good, even though the number of personnel in terms of they don't bring people into the box, they don't change things. He just comes in and literally changes the entire scope of gap responsibility. Yeah. And that's why I could see some teams, especially like we talked about, if your division has one or two teams that dominate via the run, I could see certain teams saying, all right, we're going to have to go with a nose. And if you're a 34 team, you may say, hey, we're going to have a nose and we're going to take one of our ends and he's going to move in. Let's, and he's going to be an interior penetrator. Yeah. I mean, so let's let's take this exercise and fan out from the trenches a bit. Okay. And let's talk about. Let's talk about linebackers and safeties now for those teams. Like, okay. what what what's the difference for like the linebacker that we're going to have to be looking for now? Well, I think the thing you to me one of the biggest misperceptions. Everybody talks about when you find a safety that's too big for safety, you move them to linebacker. And while that can be effective at times, the thing people don't realize is when you bring a guy who's used to playing outside and having a running start when he has to hit, and put him inside the box, things happen faster much more violent, and very few really become good. Some of them become good at chasing, like Alex Barron, I think was his name, or Mark Barron, the kid from Alabama. Yeah, The Rams moved him down. He became great in pursuit, but he was never really good at stuff coming right at him, and it wasn't that he wasn't tough or strong. It's just you've grown up your whole life playing 15 yards off the ball. You have time to read and react. When you're inside, you have about one second because that's about the time that it takes the blocker that's here or the block that's here to put their helmet in your ear hole. And if you've never done that before, it's hard. So I think what you might see is fewer safeties that don't fit as a safety moving down to linebacker. Those guys may be trapped out of a job because you're not going to keep 
those guys deepest safety because even if running becomes more prevalent, you're never going to now, well, I shouldn't say never, smart teams generally will not put either of their safeties or a guy out, the, out there at either position that is a liability in coverage. Because even if it's a running offense, if a quarterback identifies that one safety is awful in coverage, they will throw the ball and go after him all day. So I think you may see that tweener safety eliminated because you just don't have a home for him. And I wouldn't be shocked if you see the Will and the Sam become a little bit more of guys that know how to bend their knees a little bit better, can take on blocks a little better. And we talked, you mentioned before about shedding blocks. Very few linebackers are really adept at consistently getting off once a guy engages. Usually it's, oh, the guy's got me. I got to sort of lunge with an arm or he's about to get me. I better dip under. The guys like the Ray Lewis or, or that type of guy who can headbutt, jam and toss, they're hard to find. So you may say, hey, I got to get Wills and Sams who maybe they'll never be great shedders, but at least they're going to be strong enough to where when they hit and take on, they're not getting knocked back and driven out of the play. They can tie up and try to turn and control or force or stretch, whatever it may be. Wouldn't shock me to see the linebackers, especially the outside ones, get a little bigger. And maybe inside, they're maybe they're a little less sideline to sideline. You give yes. up a little bit of that that yep. rangey ability, and you hope you're, you're you you still do that with your middle linebacker, though. Yep. You want and that's why also you, you can't sacrifice your safeties. Yeah. Because if you're going to give up a little coverage with the linebackers, you have to have safeties who are ready to come down and make plays in coverage to make up for the fact that hey, linebackers probably can't get as good depth. And you know, you watch so much quarterback film that pass over the linebackers to the safety. The great offenses, that's a, that's, a, that's a vital part because it separates, it moves, it spaces out the defense. Well, if my linebackers can't get depth, my safeties have to be able to still get outside to the hashes and to the sideline, but they got to be able to squeeze up a little bit to protect over the, over the linebackers. So you can't sacrifice the safeties. I think the sacrifice will be trading a little bit on the linebackers to get guys that might be a little bit more stout. And you might even see, even if they're not bigger, you may see teams in the in the drafting and free agency, especially drafting, sort of lean towards, hey, this guy played in a conference where running was common. So he's used to 40, 50 runs a game, as opposed to a guy who's in a conference where they may run nine times a game. And yeah. just because that experience does matter. And you want guys who are used to how they're going to have to play, positioning, technique, stretching, um, could, uh forcing, containing all those different responsibilities, you want to make sure your guy knows that. Whereas if a guy has very little experience versus the run, that could be a tiebreaker difference. Yeah. I would I would think too that at the uh side kind of a um kind of a blowback of what would happen here if we get more linebackers like that is we'll start to see sa safety tackles rise again. Like we'll see we'll see the yep. the safeties who lead their team in tackles you know maybe that won't be a good thing for that team but you know you'll see more of that with with some teams and there'll be some guys who are like the john lynch's or you know who statistically may be a high tackle rate type of player and i think you'll also see safeties that even though like we said they're still going to have to cover it's going to be hard to play a safety who can cover but is not willing to come up and hit yeah because nowadays you can get away with a safety who's just going to sit deep being coverage. But if you start having to say, all right, this guy's got to move up a little bit more and helping the, the coverage game. But it also the more, even if it's two steps close to the line of scrimmage and those linebackers, maybe not as athletic to get to the fringes, these guys are going to have to fill that out. Yeah. And to do that, they're going to, and they don't have to be blow up to destroyers, but they got to be willing to at least get in that spot. And that way everybody else can help make the tackle. So I could see that, but then you get into the question of how many good coverage safeties are willing to say, all right, I'm coming. Don't worry. Like, I mean, Bob Sanders was a rarity. Yeah. I mean, right. There aren't many guys that could get to the sideline with ease or Ed Reed yet would come up and they, they'd lower the, the boom. Yeah. Again, we're mentioning two defensive players a year. So it's probably unfair to say how many guys are like them, but, good safeties who can cover but are also willing to come down and, and hit. Yeah. But we're going to hear in draft analysis over the next three to five years, if this continues, we'll start hearing people compare folks to Bob Sanders and Ed yep. Reed oh, as 100%. the aspiring, this is the aspiring style of player that they're looking for, you know? And I think that that's where 
the gist of this exercise is valuable to the fan and and you know let's let's uh, what were you going to say because i was going to go no on no, to no you're good i uh, i didn't have a new thing okay yeah. i was going to say with running back I, it's going to be interesting too because from my perspective from one of the things that i watch is you know, for all these years, it's like they're running zone. And when you run zone, unless you're in Kyle Shanahan's offense, which we've talked a lot about on this show in the past year and a half, which is, you know, don't think meat, give it the gas and just yeah. hit that crease. Um, you know, a lot of running backs who run zone, it is about the, uh, you know, about either the bounce, the cram or the cutback. And you have these multiple choices and you manipulate blockers and the defenders and you read your keys and you have really refined footwork and to the ability to be able to make um, moves on a dime and, and, and set things up when you're within like a yard of the line of scrimmage or a step of your blocker and being able to do the, make these changes. Whereas with gap plays, you can do some subtle things to like help work that puller into a, into a defender but you're hitting that thing a lot harder, a lot faster, a lot earlier. And it's about athletic ability, you know, and, and a lot and to a great degree. So are we, it seems to me, we're going to be even more forgiving of running backs on a level where it's like, look, we're looking for the top athlete who can just tear through a crease and they're only going to have one or two, you know, they're only going to really have one crease. So why, why the, worry the about that? The only thing I will caveat though with is I think the instincts will still be very important. Yeah. Because the problem you run into is if we were talking 15 years ago NFL, some of those guys in pursuit are not the athletes of today. So if you misread it 20 years ago and you're a rare athlete, you might be able to make it work. In today's NFL, if you misread it, and I'm not saying you got to be perfect. Right. But more often you than probably, not, you got to be more. And and this is where, to me, a guy that might fit better in this than he has the first part of his career is a guy like Melvin Gordon. Yeah. To me, he could be a guy because he's not ever going to be that super unbelievable jump cut guy, but he's got enough to make a change of direction because he is an upright guy and he does bounce into his blockers at times, but he's so dynamic when he makes a decision and just says go, he just explodes and he's got balance. He can run through contact. Types guys like that are going to have, I think, more value, like you talked about, than the sort of guys who try to wait things out. I mean, to me, guys like Hunt, guys like Chubb, their value could go way up because, especially Hunt, I mean, he runs like he's like just a cannibal, like yeah, just shoot me at the direction and I'm going to run through everything. To me, he could be super valuable. But I will add that the one thing that is not going to change if they can't catch the ball and help in pass pro. I don't care how effective they are running. They're still not getting on the field yeah. because even with this change, you're still going to have to have them be a valuable part of your passing attack because if they're not, then you just threw the flag up said, okay, when he's in, it's either a run or he's yeah. going to stand here and do nothing. Yeah. You better have an all world offensive line that and a great running quarterback to create <laughs> enough binds for the defense to say well we know that they're going to run we just don't know who they're who's going to get the ball exactly and yep. we may not be able to stop them anyway but like there's one team in the league that might get a shot of being able to do that so yeah but like yeah i mean I, I, another good example of that is rashad penny who was a gap runner at san diego state and they just drafted kenneth walker who's a really good zone runner like he's a very patient guy um whereas Penny needed a little bit of time to work up to what they were doing with some of the zone stuff, but now they're running more gap plays because of what we're seeing. And he's just tearing through people. And he, and how you described Melvin Gordon is how you could actually describe um, um, Penny, Penny in terms yep. of some of the things that he ends up doing at the line of scrimmage, but because he's so shifty and so explosive, he can, he can do some things where you look at it, it looks like a highlight play, but part of it is is that he just didn't get on track in the way that he needed to, but he could quickly readjust and still exploit the crease. Well, I think what you might see is you might see some guys, you might be able to trade a little bit of agility for power and explosion because when you look at a guy like Gordon or even like Penny, you're never going to mistake them for the Eckler who puts a foot in the ground and literally bounces over to the other side of the block, but then right. it can happen but they're agile enough that they can make a cut. Now they may need a second foot to gather and whatever, but the difference is once they cut, they explode and they violently explode. So you yeah. can make up for that. And if you can put guys like that on the edges 
giving them a chance to really just, oh, there's a slight crease and just they hit it so fast. It reminds me a little bit, and you remember from back in the Broncos with Shannon, was Olendis Garrett. Yeah. I mean, he was sort of the perfect example of the guy that would fit in it. He wasn't a rare guy in terms of cutting, but he was rare in terms of when he saw it, boom, he hit it, and he ran with pad level and could run through contact. Now, I don't think he survived in today's NFL because I don't know how nifty he would be catching the ball out of the backfield. Right. But running the ball, that's the type of guy I could see really becoming sort of back in as an NFL running back as opposed to the pace and shifty Edwards Hilaire who may not be as great a fit for that type of offense, even though I think he's a hell of a player and does well in what they ask him. I don't know if he would fit as well in that type of offense. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's funny because the Chiefs are running more gap as well. They're running more counter. And they're fitting a lot of that, I think, for Isaiah Pacheco, who is... Who's a perfect example of this. Yes. Yes, and exactly. And he can pass pro and he can catch. So there's there might be a future for that kid in Kansas City for longer than a year. You know, might oh, be yeah. a few years for him. I mean, I mean, truthfully, those two together. Yeah. When you have Mahomes and you have Andy's creativity, that could be a dangerous, I mean, because they could then start doing some really unique things with both those guys out on the field. Oh, that would be fun to watch. I mean, because yeah. Andy's as creative as they get. Yeah, and I mean, it's, you know, another guy who's a good example of why he's like succeeding right now. And we've talked about him a lot too in different reasons, but Cordero Patterson. I mean, the fact that you're 31 years old, I think it's the most fun just story. It is. It's amazing. Yeah, a 31-year-old guy who just couldn't find his fit at the position that he was drafted at for the reasons you brought up very well even at that time. Just saying, you know, kids kids just not going to be very good at, at absorbing scheme type of things week to week as a wide receiver reading coverages and things like that. But we've all, we all know that he was like an elite open field runner. And the fact that teams started via, you know, Bella, get Belichick. Belichick, or, no doubt. He's got to get a lot of credit. Yeah. yeah. Give him credit for using them on toss and in the eye formation and on gap plays. They just couldn't run as many of those plays as that. Now you can run them. And Atlanta, yep. I mean, it's just like, when he's in the game, he's now 230, 235. And, and he's such a – he's a yeah. tough kid. He's super competitive. From what I've been told, he's an amazing team guy, like whatever they want him to do. So when you combine all those things and you see just the rare talent, like when the ball's in his hands, I mean, you can remember seeing him on those kickoff returns. I mean, there's something special to this kid. Yeah. So now it's, it's a shame he got hurt. But to me, those are the types of guys – that in this new sort of what we're talking about, what could be sort of coming back into fashion, guys like him, oh, man, you talk about – it wouldn't shock me to see more teams trying to look at receivers yeah. that maybe they don't feel have a true fit but have the physique to where they could handle being in the backfield and saying, okay, this is a really good run after catch guy. He was a really good kickoff returner, so he knows how to hit the hole aggressively. This might be a guy that would fit in this type of scheme where he doesn't have to be the wiggle. He's yeah. got to be the foot in the ground and go. Yeah. That's why, that's why Debo works the way he does with what the no 49ers do. Doubt. You know, yeah. He's, I he's, mean, yeah, he, 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 exactly. He's not a complete runner. you you know, you put him in short yardage situations in certain, in certain looks and he's going to fail, you know, but then there are other looks that you, you play and it's like, he's the most dangerous running back on that team. Um, yep. You know, so, so what about quarterbacks? You know, if if the vertical passing game starts to become, say, a smaller percentage play because of these two high shells and they need to run the ball more, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is, I mean, look at the Eagles another as another example, or even the Jaguars to an extent. Jaguars have a good running back in, in James Robinson. They've got the speedster Debo type in Etienne or the wannabe Debo type. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I would say well, that's probably the better way to accurately put it. And then the Eagles, they can just run everything. Um, depending on who they want to put in there, they can they can run with it um, because of that line. But both of them, I just watched both those quarterbacks, and it's like there's a lot of – they're, they're, I'm not saying they can't make multiple reads. They can. We've seen all of them make – both of them make multiple reads – 
two, three reads and progressions in the past, but it's not the strength of their game. Like if something gets foiled that they didn't expect, they hold on to the ball a long time, they lean on their athletic ability, and there are not many Russell Wilsons out there who can kind of move around or Lamar Jacksons who can move around and buy the time on a consistent basis or make the quick decision with a little bit of movement and be able to know when to mix that. You end up either with Kyler Murray who drops his head, puts the ball about two yards behind his body and yeah. runs to a spot and forces his receivers to reroute or Baker Mayfield, who's not quite mobile enough. Um, but, and, and when he does break contain, he basically screws up his blocking blockers leverage and now forces receivers to reroute and misses them. And one's able to buy eight seconds occasionally and keep your team in the game maybe a little longer. One key, one can't keep your team in the game without a great team around them. So these two guys, Lawrence and, and Allen, it seems like, you know, they're giving them opportunities to avoid that that problem and saying, let's let's scheme things enough. A lot of you know, for the for the Eagles, we're seeing a lot of tight end screens. We're seeing a lot of post um or double posts or double slants or double seams and there and there's you can take five or six plays and put a lot of window dressing on them to make them look different and they're really just variations of the same thing and they're and it's like we're not they're not reading the field like you know side to sideline to sideline it's more like bait the defense this way to give time to set up what's happening on the opposite side and go to that. It's the Lincoln Riley type type of influence of offense that we're seeing in the NFL. So with the vertical passing becoming a smaller percentage play, are we going to see more quarterbacks maybe do this type of work? And does that mean when we draft these, when we're drafting quarterbacks, our team's going to feel like, you know, they fit in our offense so well that we don't need to look for the guy to be the future, you know, to be the future Tom Brady or um, or like Josh Allen, everything type of quarterback to an extent that, that they look for. Well, I think what you'll see is if they don't view that person as a rare special potential guy, then they're going to start saying, okay, what fits what we need, which is you're probably going to see teams say, you know what? For years, mistakes have been made on overvaluing arm strength. Now we can really say we don't need a cannon. Yeah. And because that to me, that's one of the things I was first taught way back when in the league. And it's been reiterated from by some very smart people, which is the most mistakes evaluating quarterbacks happen from putting too much emphasis on arm strength. Because you only need the minimum. Once you identify the minimum arm strength needed, that's what I need. I don't need the maximum. Yeah. And so I think you'll be able to get away. Maybe the guys, and I'm not trying to knock him as an overall quarterback, but the guys with the Aaron Rodgers or Jay Cutler type arm that can just make the 50 yard far side out throw without even moving their feet. Cause they're so rare. Maybe that arm isn't needed. Maybe it's, are you decisive? Because that's really one of the things you're going to need is, Hey, you're making one read or maybe two. You're not going through the whole thing. If that reads there, I need you to decide balls out or run or escape the pocket and create something on out in space. So I need someone who's decisive, who can get rid of the ball quickly. And I need accuracy. I need someone who can anticipate and throw accurately on short routes. I'm not going to be as stressed on stuff 15 yards or more because I'm not going to be asking you to do that as often. Do you know who's about to become that quarterback? Who's going to be a journeyman and have like, and maybe even have a run as a starter and he just got his debut last week for the Patriots as Bailey Zappi. Oh, he fits that perfectly. I can't wait perfectly. to see what he does. Yes. Yeah. He, he's, he's mo to me, he's one of the more unique guys. I was actually teaching my class last night. And one of the kids in the class said, well, I graded Zappi. And he graded his first game. And he was like, yeah, I really wasn't impressed. I was like, hey, firstly, he's a rookie quarterback. Most of them suck. Secondly, yeah. <laughs> he's a rookie from Western Kentucky. Yeah. He's going to suck even more. Right. I said, give the kid a break. I said, I said, jumping from Alabama to the NFL is hard enough. Nonetheless, Western Kentucky. But when you look at what Zappi can do, he may not have the cannon, but I think he has enough of an arm. He is, an, in my opinion, almost an, a, overconfident. Like He believes like when he sees that the ball's out, yes. there's not a lot of dilly-dallying. He sees it, ball's out. And I think he's a pretty accurate thrower 
and puts it where the receiver can make yes. the catch. So you see those things. And I also think he's a better athlete than I think people yeah. realize coming in. He can move. He can get on the – I'm not saying he's going to outrun Kyler Murray and go 70 yards, but he can keep control of his body when he's outside the pocket and make accurate throws from uncomfortable positions. Yeah. I think I think this kid's going to wind up having a 10-year career – or or fifteen year career if he can stay healthy enough that he has no catastrophic injury because this if this if this trend continues he fits perfectly to exactly what you described once he develops a little bit you know yeah and and I mean even if he never becomes the starter if you find that starter in the system we're talking about and you need that backup because you always want your backup to have a similar style so you don't have to revamp your whole offense he's the perfect guy. I mean, there's a lot to like about it. Another guy who might fit in that to a lesser extent, who who keeps hanging around practice squads, is Jake Fromm, who also yep. is kind of a minimal, you know, the minimum arm strength. Maybe if he can build it up a little bit more than what, you know, he might be below the minimum. That's where he's on that little threshold. But if he can get a little stronger there, he has the movement skills. He makes quick decisions he could be a guy that might find his way into that kind of scenario. Easton Stick is hanging around, and there's, there's a mobile a great kid. Example. You know, yeah. that's another a one. Great leader. Yeah. With probably just barely adequate arm strength. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, but you know what's funny when you when I talk about these traits, the guy that jumps out is oh, I have everything that you're talking about except for the decisiveness is Baker. Yeah. Is Baker's athletic. He's, he can be a very accurate thrower. Yeah. He can be beautiful in terms of when he sees what's going on. But the problem is he's not decisive. He holds it. He waits. He wants the perfect throw. That's right. And therefore, he sits in the pocket. He starts getting frenetic and then makes bad decisions. If he had that instant decisiveness, you could be talking about a pro bowler in this type of way the NFL is developing. And I feel like it's that trait that people miss so much with quarterbacks and I feel like that's like a I almost feel like that's a hard out like if you don't show that if you don't show that I don't know how many quarterbacks who have developed that oh no and you know it's funny I've broken it down when I teach my class I go through like the things you look for for by position one of them for quarterback I write release quickness but I always tell my class I said it's two things I said you have the physical which is from the moment the ball starts to move until it's gone I said the other part, which is hard, and I said sometimes you can't actually figure it out, is trying to figure out from the moment they see it yes. to the moment the ball starts moving, the mental release quickness. Yeah, That's where, to me, Brady, Rodgers, where they separate themselves is it almost seems instantaneous that the moment they get their feet, they just it, it's like you see it and boom, the ball's out. Whereas other guys... You can see it's like, okay, they, they stop, their eyes are focused, but it's another beat before the ball That's starts right. moving. Alex and Smith was a perfect example of that. Yes, exactly. He was, and this is the example I always talk about, because people say, I'll say, they're, they're smart kids, but they have slow processors. Justin Fields a smart kid with a slow processor. And, and I'd say you have to delineate that, especially in today's times, because 100%. you don't want people to say, well, you, are you saying is dumb? And then it becomes, is it, you know, are you saying that the black quarterback doesn't have enough facility to be, uh, or black players can't be, you know, good quarterbacks in the NFL, which of course no one's saying no. that. But the thing is, is that he has a slow processor to where he needs to wait and beat. And the examples I always give are, are Alex Smith and Ryan Fitzpatrick have always had something a little lacking with their processor, and it's the and they are two of the they may be the book smartest in the last twenty years exactly. Yeah. And they're but but Brett Favre, who didn't know what a nickel was, was was the one of the most decisive quarterbacks. Sometimes he didn't see it, but he yep. was he was very decisive. And the two guys that I look at right now, who at least in the past fifteen years that I've studied quarterbacks, well seven, well eighteen now, is the two guys who had the quickest processors I've seen graded thus far are Pat Mahomes and Chad Kelly. Those were the two that that had the that just it, it was immediate. If they saw yeah. it, the, it is the ball out right. of their arm. Yeah. Yep. So. And see, I like to talk a bit. Not even I don't even call it processing. 
I like to call it, hey, it's just a natural instinctive reaction. From the moment it clicks in their eyes yeah. till the, 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 the synapses send the signal. And, it, and we're not talking four seconds or six seconds. We're talking probably the difference of a hundredth of a second to a tenth of a second. Yeah. But that difference is enough for when the ball starts to move, the DB is launching. Yeah. Whereas the, the, it's instantaneous, the ball's already halfway yeah. out before the it's, DB launch. And it's it's hard to define. It's like I call it confidence sometimes, yep. and say it's confidence because I I equate it to an onstage performance, like an actor who has to hit that mark and have Instant. great timing, yep. or or a or an improvisational musician who has to respond to what they're hearing and continue to make it musical. And it's like when you see an extra pad of the ball. A pump fake, bringing the ball down, an extra, an extra hop on the feet, an extra hitch, all those things, and you've looked, and scary. you can see it. You know that they're that they they're waiting for that perfect moment, and they're too late, and it's yep. already and, passed and, them and by. The hardest part is there are some guys I've watched, and I've watched six, seven, eight games. I just can't find it, yes. good or bad. It's yeah. like I don't know if they're quick or bad process certain guys you instantly see it because they're literally and you can really see it a lot on the end zone film because you can see they're going through and their heads clicking and instantly literally their head is just clicking in and the ball it's like god dang they didn't even get to the full progression they just saw it out of the corner of their eye and they knew ball's got to be out or sometimes the guys who are going through the progression they realize oh my god if this is here and this is here i know this guy's up. They don't even look. They yeah. just start the throwing motion before they turn. Yeah. That's one of the things Brady's so great at. Brady will be looking here, going through, and all of a sudden you can see he realizes, ah, the backside post. And he'll not even look until the ball's almost out of his hand because he knows that's where it is. And he's decisive. He doesn't wait because if you turn, all of a sudden the defense goes, ding, ding, change, go there. And it's it's a rare thing, and it's hard to find. So it's funny because this made me think of this guy, and I did a I I do a Friday piece every once in a while where I talk about who was what made them great, you know, and and a guy I've always been a huge fan of as a quarterback, especially as the years have gone by, who never really got to be the player he should have been, um, other than maybe for a year, and that was Jim McMahon. Jim oh. McMahon. What when when you know you'll hear John Madden and highlight clips say he was every bit as good as Montana at the top of his game, and people would go that sounds crazy. But when you watch when you watch him, what was amazing was that that identification to action of getting the ball out immediately. And what was amazing about it is his mechanics were unbelievable. He could every whether he was running full barrel up in into a space in the pocket or running to his left or to his right and having to change speed or stop, start, or whatever. Whenever that would happen, whatever he was doing, the when it was time to throw, he literally looked like a dad going to like his four-year-old, teaching him how to catch with like a Nerf ball going. Like, and it, it looks just, that easy, yeah. whether he was throwing a short or he was putting tons of mustard, it was... And when you see that, that tell that it, that just I mean, yeah, I remember him. He was one of those guys you're gonna look back and you wonder if you it's sort of like Bo Jackson. It's like if you could have just found a way to keep that summon of gun healthy. Yeah. Because man, was he fun to watch. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, he was and he was a great on field leader. He was a great field general in terms of understanding the offense. And yeah, I mean, was he a guy, you know, Mike Ditka and him clashed on the offense and you know, but you kind of want a you want a guy who is. That's the thing about managing people is that sometimes you want the guy who's a little bit contrarian, who's a little bit like I know better than you, but is enough, but has enough sense to back it up. And yeah, I well, think, you almost wonder was it because Mike and him had similar personalities? Yeah, they were yeah. both sort of because every a lot of quarterbacks are alpha dogs. Yeah, they're they're yeah. the big. Well, Mike was an alpha dog as a tight end and as a human being. Yes. So you almost wonder if there was just a rub every day, all day with those guys. And there had to be. And it's funny. And you think of like, I always love the, 
I was listening to, there was a great series of YouTube videos that I was using as part of the things that I was scouting as well. Some They have some games of him, complete games on YouTube that I was watching. And, and it's fascinating, but like when the, the first, they talk, he talks about an interview he had or how when he arrived in, you know, arrived in the Chicago's facility after the draft, you know, in a limo drinking a six pack of Bud. He showed up and and Papa Bear's there and Papa Bear is doing the whole kind of gruff, I'm going to test you kid type of thing. And he's like, yeah, he goes, I don't know why we drafted you. You're like a, you're a, you're noodle armed. You've got a bad eye, you, you know, your arm suspect. He goes, yeah, you've got a bad eye, your arm suspect and something else. And, and you're kind of undersized. And he goes, you belong in the CFL. And, 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 and apparently, you know, McMahon said, he said, I just looked back at him and go, so why'd you draft me old man? You yeah, know, exactly, and, right? you know, he didn't care, you know, and it was yeah. like though that type of thing too. I mean, it, it's fascinating because that, that ability to just recognize and, and just have that confidence of hitting your mark. It's, it's almost like, I, I, I guess the best way to call it is confident rhythm. You know, yep. it's just like an instinctive rhythm to like you, you hit your marks right away. So, so which makes me wonder: Is there with all the technology now, are there tests where you can put them in earphones, watching a screen, and where they have a certain, where they have to hit something every time they see something, where you can start figuring out does their brain process at a, which ones process faster or slower? Yeah, I, and I wonder. But then I wonder. I agree. I, I hope there is, and it would be awesome if there is. But then I wonder. Will they be able to game that because it's just different enough that it's that yes. there's not enough there that you can end yeah. up gaming it and then they're going to get false they're going to get false reads or false positives well, or well false I'll give negatives. you an example of, of a test sort of not for quarterbacks but they, the NFL teams use for pass rushers is they'll you've probably seen it where they put the quarterback dummy and then they put the cones where they got the guys got to come off and just how fast they get to the the dummy and touch them. Well, NFL teams started doing something where they will put the guy in a pass rush stance and they time him from the moment he moves until the moment he touches the quarterback. Then they have him do it again and they time him from the moment the ball moves to the moment he touches the quarterback to see what that differential is. And I only found this out when I went to work for the Browns because they had showed me the data that Courtney Brown, who turned out to be one of the bigger busts, he had a massive differential. So he didn't have that reaction to the snap. And this kid that I think they had drafted late or gotten as a free agent at Arkansas State, I think, named Mark Work, who ended up being a productive pass rusher for like six, seven years, he had the number one one the differential in their system that year. Wow. In the same draft class, he ended up – now, he was not a great player. Yeah. But that reactionary time, because that, just like with a quarterback, that ability to get off the ball instantly, it matters. Yeah. More than almost anything else. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, can we? Do you, does it seem obvious that that if this trend goes the way that we're thinking, that that it looks like at least for right now, that slot receiver would be the position that would be the biggest loser out of this, or is it? Just, I mean, I know it depends on teams, and I'm not saying they're all going to be gone. Yeah, I would say the small slot receiver. Yes. Because the bigger one, you'll still have value because you can say, you know what? He's well, he, we can use David him Bell on the fringe. David Bell. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or Keenan out. You can say, okay, Keenan, you can be there. You can take on the will. You may not dominate him, but you're big enough to get in his way and slow him down. Yeah. Whereas Hunter Renfro, uh, Renfro or Diggs, that middle linebacker may pick him up and throw him into the stands. Yes. So, the, yeah, that the small slot receiver, I could see that guy, and like we talked about, the tweener, the combo safety linebacker, those two could be the guys that sort of those teams won't use. Now, they'll still have a home because all 32 teams aren't going to yeah. do this, but I think those teams without a frontline elite quarterback, I think you could see them start saying, how do we manipulate the offense to hide his lack of elite pl passing skills and run the ball to make our offense more dynamic. Yeah, and when I mention those players, I think of them not as that they're going to fall by the wayside, but players who will get compared to them as aspiring yes. Hunter yeah, yeah. Renfro's. Those guys aren't going anywhere. They, yeah. yeah, they may wind up 
they may wind up those guys where they might have wound up with an enhanced opportunity somewhere not, you know a year or two ago in three years if they're coming into the league they might just be special teamers at best or reserves exactly yeah, yeah. that's the better way to say because it. it's not like they're gonna be gone it's just they're gonna be probably less opportunities for them to display their skills as a receiver yeah they get caught up in the wash well one thing is you know someone who doesn't get caught up in the wash very often here is you know russ landy and we get a chance to you know have him on the show you know every week or every other week talking about um scouting and for have these fun conversations and uh you know you can you can find him on twitter you can you know also of course you know he's the he's the head of u.s scouting for um the montreal alouettes and we're back to seven and seven by the way after being two and six nice That's run amazing. nice yeah, run congratulations yeah. very cool well find me at matt waldman and we appreciate you listening and uh catch us again in a couple weeks take care